All right, we're, we're recording. Hi, everyone. This is a special session on using technology in the, uh, in the classroom and teaching and learning. Uh, and my name is Dr. Alec Rose, and I'm happy to uh, facilitate this session. Uh, if you are actually there somewhere out there, can you just say hi in the chat so I know that I'm not talking to uh, uh, mystery people, that there's actually people here. I'm, I'm assuming you can actually say something in there. Yep, great, thanks. Thanks for saying hi, I hope you're all well. Good morning to you, thank you. All right, so um, I'm not sure what the other webinars look like, but I'm assuming there's something like this. Uh, feel free to say hi uh, in the chat, I'll be watching that. Um, I'll try to keep track of it. Um, I also, if you, if you want, if you have a, Q, a question, Feel free to go to the Q&A um, and uh, leave a question there. Uh, you can also raise your hand, I believe, as well. So I should be able to see uh, that as well, just to see if you're there. Um, I'm going to get started with the presentation. Um, but essentially, I'm hoping to provide a little bit of information uh, uh, around this area, but also to provide um, some hands-on experience as well with some, some new tools. So I'm going to uh, start the presentation. Uh, let me know if you're not able to see some slides in a few seconds here. So I'm gonna run that. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen. Second desktop. And uh, you should be able to see some slides. All right, so this was a, this was a presentation that I actually, um, uh, did for uh, a school district uh, in Prince Albert uh, recently and uh, I figured it was um, uh, I think it was, figured it was relevant to uh, this particular session as well so I've adapted it a bit um, <clears throat> oh you can't see the slides uh, does anyone else have that problem no yes or no can you, uh, can you let me know in the chat if you can see my slides or not Cannot see, okay. Okay, I'll try again. Let's see. I should have shared the right one. Okay, so I'll share the screen. Desktop number two. And I'll hit share. Oops. And what about now? Yes, okay, all right, I'm not sure what happened. Did the same thing, okay, good. Um, so a little bit about me, uh, I've been an educator for quite some time. I started in K-12 education um, and uh, I taught mostly middle years to high school uh, and high school most of the time. And I taught in a number of different schools and school districts. Um, now I spend a lot of time using technology in my undergraduate and graduate courses and helping others uh, become YouTubers, be become more competent with ed tech in the classroom. And these are all uh, examples of some of my students, just sort of gifts that you've, that I've taken from their videos. Um, and it's really amazing to see um, when teachers engage in technology that they can do some amazing things for learning and of course for student engagement which is part of what this is all about i'm also a parent of four kids um, and uh, i spend a lot of time watching them grow up with technology so a lot of the stuff i do beyond the literature and the research is informed by how my kids interface with technology and you can imagine that um, living through covid right now and having four kids uh, at home when school is out uh, is difficult, um, but I'm, I'm very fortunate to have some of the technology I have. So for instance, um, this is a, a Scratch. If anyone's seen Scratch Junior, um, this is a great tool and they've got, another, they've got an app and they've got a few other things. Uh, this is my five-year-old creating a, or coding a little bit of a, uh, a game with his uh, with the little cat that comes with Scratch. Um, Scratch is one of the better, better tools for helping students learn computational thinking, um, as well as uh, 
you know, some, some initial coding uh, as well, so learning algorithms and so on. So if you haven't had a chance, uh, it's worthwhile, it's free, it's from MIT, it's been open sourced, and there's lots of resources there as well. Um, my uh, nine-year-old, I think she just turned 10, uh, is kind of a TikToker. Um, so she's, for a lot of the stuff that she's been doing is trying to understand the um, uh, sort of the intersection with technology and society. Um, you know, not in those particular terms, but it's interesting to see her engage uh, in different ways with technology, um, especially when we're thinking about identity and privacy and all of the other things as well that we have to discuss with her as well. Um, my 13 year old is, um, this is him playing, if you haven't seen uh, this particular game, it's called Beat Saber. Um, it actually has a nice kinesthetic educational approach to it if you haven't played with it. Um, but VR is an opening field that has some real possibilities in terms of learning. So uh, some of you may have experienced, this is the Sony one, we also have the Oculus as well. Um, and then my daughter is more traditional, but she's using an iPad to do a lot of her artwork and music making and so on. And so with all of this, you know, I'm very fortunate to have some of the technology available to me. Um, but of course, this is not the case for many students out there who, um, who still can gain and learn from the technology, but access is a real problem. And it has been great to see some of the school districts um, start to think about access more in this uh, COVID time where I've seen a number of school districts across the country um, supplement their students with uh, additional laptops to, to create more of a one-to-one -one, uh, sort of circumstance. And even in some cases providing uh, like MiFi or portable Wi-Fi into, into homes. So it's been kind of neat to see that, but it should have been happening a long time ago. But that's something that you'll have to come up, come up against is that there's some immense and incredible technologies that you'll experience throughout your career, but getting them to students is always a difficult thing. So we're gonna to try to get through some things um, that should be accessible to most people um, with the bare minimum of having some sort of device. Um, I'm not gonna go through some of the COVID expectations, but uh, what's interesting about this right now, I won't go through some of the possibilities because there has been some change in the guidance around what government may do. Um, this is actually a teacher, uh, Gord Winship from Ontario, who does some drawings of his classroom. This is his classroom right now. Uh, he expects in, in, in the coming weeks that if they're gonna look at abiding by the principles around social distancing, his, his classroom is gonna look more like that. So from 33 students to 12 students, and that throughout the semester, they're probably gonna go back and forth. Um, some speculation on alternating days, um, if you're gonna you know, abide by this sort of thing. But um, they're, they're being hyper aware and, and certainly prepared for the possibility that things might go back to a remote teaching, uh, you know, a remote teaching mode where some of what you're using, the technology, um, will be from home or students will be from home. And certainly there'll be a number of parents that um, don't wanna send their kids back to school um, during this time, given the, some of the dangers uh, that are coming with the, the pandemic. So what I'm hoping to give you is um, some promising practices around what you could be doing. These will apply not only to um, the regular face-to-face -face classroom, but a lot of the principles, I believe, uh, are helpful with uh, if you're going to go into a remote teaching mode. So for the most part, if you learn a lot of the technologies, you're going to also learn a lot of the flexibility that comes with using some of the technologies, uh, especially around presence and engagement and so on. So um, starting off with tech integration, though, one of the first things that you should know about uh, is, and I don't know if you've taken an EDDC 300 course or other uh, advanced courses in educational technology, but this particular model is what's called SAMR, the SAMR model, uh, and it's a good framework for thinking about using technology in the classroom. And essentially, if you look at the four uh, levels here, 
Um, and, and just because there's sort of four levels, it doesn't mean that um, you know, the fourth level redefinition is always a goal. Um, sometimes the lower levels are certainly appropriate. It depends on some of the pedagogical goals that you're looking at. So for instance, uh, substitution, the very first one, uh, is, is typically when technology is used in a way to replace something uh, almost in the same manner. So a whiteboard or a uh, smart board, some teachers will use it almost exactly how they use a chalkboard. There's not much benefit. In the fact, there's some disadvantage because you have to uh, think about power, you have to learn some of the tools, you might have a technology hang up and so on. Um, and so for the most part, some of these things aren't gonna be much better. But as you move towards it, you want to move towards augmentation where technologies, um, you know, tech acts as a direct tool substitute, but there's some functional improvement. So a smart board, for instance, has the functional improvement that you can uh, easily erase it, you can uh, digitize it, you can send it out to people. And so that's when you see the augmentation of a similar technology. Um, then there's modification and redefinition. And this is where you get uh, to a point where technology does something that's different, uh, or you're able to do something different, uh, uh, able to do something different, uh, something that you could now do if uh, you couldn't do unless the technology existed. So I'll give you an example of that, um, a bit of a metaphorical example, I guess, but um, this is uh, one for music. This is uh, uh, one of the first videos I saw on YouTube. This is back from 2006 when YouTube was fairly new. But I've kept this in the back of my mind because I think it's uh, kind of a great example of technology um, augmenting or even redefining um, the, the, the talents and the abilities of, uh, of a, uh, an individual in this case. So um, this is amateur. I'll run the video, you should really hear it in a second. Essentially what you have here is a guy who cannot uh, play the drums or uh, you'll see piano in a second, but he's a really great video, video editor. And so what you have here uh, is someone who um, is basically recording every, um, uh, every time he hits a drum or cymbal, and then, and then he feeds that into um, his video editing um, software and is able to make music that way. So this is what it looks like. And then if you fast forward a bit, he's actually able to uh, accompany himself with piano, he does the same exact thing with piano as well. And as you go to near the end, what I like about this is he says, uh, by and with, his name was Lassie Gerritsen. Uh, all the sounds are the actual audio from the original videotape. No alterations have been made other than basic time I'm editing. I can neither play the drums nor the piano. And I just love this idea as an example of an assistive technology or um, a technology that allows you to redefine what you're able to do in terms of your own skill set. I just love the idea because he can clearly um, play the drums and the piano but not in the more traditional sense. He's able to use technology to, to, to use it in a different way. Um, so I'm gonna see if I can break for a second to uh, ask you a few questions. So um, one of my favorite tools is something called Mentimeter, which you can get a, a free-ish version of. So I'm gonna bring this up. You should still, still be able to see my screen and I was hoping that you could participate in this. So basically a Mentimeter is something that you can solicit information, kind of a polling software um, from students. Uh, and it works really well if you're looking for anonymous type info, um, or if you're just looking to pull the class in different ways. 
So I'm hoping that um, those who are here can go to um, uh, menti.com. I'll just kind of leave it up like this, menti.com. Uh, and then when you go to menti.com, you should be able to input a, a number. So it's M-E-N-T-I.com and use the code 50.32, uh, or sorry, 50.32.85. And you, when you get there, you should be able to see three um, blanks. And I'm just wondering, since I don't know much uh, what your experience is with educational technology, what tools you may know, uh, I'm wondering if you can provide some feedback. So go ahead and uh, if you're there, uh, feel free to uh, provide some feedback. So Kahoot, Google Classroom, you have two very popular ones for sure. Uh, anyone else? What else might you be using? Even, even if it's the same ones, um, this is actually a, kind of a, a Wordle type thing, a word cloud, which it, it shows the, the most popular ones. So Zoom, of course, uh, is a, a big player. Seesaw, um, for those who don't know that, what that is, very popular in, um, uh, very popular these days, certainly in the primary grades. Uh, there's Mathletics, uh, Word Cloud, uh, uh, Raz Kids. Yeah, a lot of these ones, podcasts for your own listening. Uh, there's Kahoot again, tablets and so on. So that's, that's great. Thanks for providing the feedback. YouTube, of course, is a big one. Uh, laptops and, of course, depending on where you end up, uh, you might end up in a laptop uh, like a one-to-one -one classroom, there are a few in Regina, um, or you might end up with nothing or tablets, of course. Um, so great, thank you for, for those. I'm gonna go to the next question here, hopefully, if I can get to the next question. Uh, for some reason it's not, there we go. So what are the key benefits of using technology and teaching learning? So when you think about why you would use technology. Um, I'd love to hear your um, thoughts on this. Like, what are some of the benefits? You can just give me a, a short sentence or um, whatever you uh, can contribute in terms of why you might use technology in teaching and learning. Uh, connect the classroom and make learning accessible to all learners. Great point. Um, Supporting individuals to achieve a higher level and zone of proximal development. Um, glad you got the, the, the technology, the uh, sort, sort of the, uh, the background, the theoretical background. Children more engaged. Uh, it's a way of the world now. Flexibility with remote learning, certainly. Uh, better engagements, uh, we see, uh, can be used to support students' educational needs. And of course, uh, thinking about differentiated instruction, it's quite good in that way. Uh, can give different perspectives, more global ability to help parents uh, learn uh, with their children, um, accessible for students, and especially uh, there's a number of assistive and accessible technologies. There's also a, a universal design for learning framework, which is uh, could be a topic for another session. Uh, teaching a generation, so you know it's what our students know. Their familiarity certainly is uh, is important with this. Helps teach kids school skills of the future. Yeah, so lots of really great points. So thanks for that uh, piece here. Um, at the same time, of course, there's, there's disadvantages. And I'm wondering if you could think of some of the disadvantages that we have with using technology and teaching and learning. And these are often apparent when you're actually trying to use them uh, in, in the classroom. Limited internet access, whether it's in schools or by a student or at home. There's still a huge divide between rural uh, rural schools, uh, certainly uh, even um, in First Nations communities, uh, northern communities. We see a, a lot of um, limited internet internet access, um, inequitable, unequal access. This is certainly one of the big things that's been highlighted. Uh, can result in har harassment if misused. So there's lots of bullying and harassment. Distractions, off-task behavior, lack of security, um, really good, lots of good stuff here. More screen time, um, and of course, screen time is a real issue with younger kids in particular. Uh, limited face-to-face -face interaction, 
Uh, it could be hard for students who prefer kinesthetic learning. Uh, these are all really great points. So I'm glad that you, you've uh, taken this seriously and provided some really good stuff here. Um, and I just want to get a sense of your own competency or at least your self-efficacy in terms of how competent you feel about using technology. So you should see three sliders right now. And this will give you um, the ability to see at least one person doesn't feel very competent with technology. Um, some are getting a little bit more. Um, and I'll show you this sort of the distribution in a second. And this is pretty similar for the most part. Um, um, most of when I use this particular graph, it's typical that um, competency, how, like how competent you feel in using tech and teaching and learning um, is much lower, whereas personal life is typically much higher. And this is a very um, similar uh, curve or uh, distribution that we often see. And by the way, if you're using something like Mentimeter, um, what I love about this is you can actually see the distribution. So I can see that there's at least one person that doesn't feel very competent in this area. But for the most part, if you look at uh, the distribution, quite a few of you feel quite competent there. If you look at this, uh, it's important to know that, you know, there are a few people over here, although the distribution starts to skew this way um, towards something higher, there's actually a lot of people on the lower end of the spectrum. And the same thing with professional learning, although this seems to balance almost perfectly here, um, that people are feeling semi-confident about this. So um, just, you know, just as an aside, uh, Mentimeter can be a really great tool to help to better know your students, to, to assess their competency in, um, in a way that you can do it anonymously. And so you can learn a lot from your students, their beliefs, um, their thoughts, their, their, their feelings, um, and, and just their you know, general knowledge in a tool like this. Um, so you may want to pick up something like Mentimeter. Uh, again, has a free version of it, uh, really easy to use. All right. So uh, I'm going to go through a number of tips with some examples, and we'll have some time to play a little bit. Um, I'm going to give you what I've been hearing from the field, and I've been working with a number of districts to help them um, you know, figure out what's going on. I've also been speaking to parents about what they want for uh, certainly the remote learning time, but in general, these things uh, are quite appropriate even beyond that. So number one is developing a structured learning environment. And you know, when you do this, when you think about this in the classroom, um, you see all sorts of models and lots of teachers do this differently. Some will have a very, very structured um, linear classroom. Um, sometimes this is not even the choice you wanna make, but it's because you have so many students in your classroom that you end up thinking that this is about the only way you can actually arrange desks. Um, but certainly, you know, there's more uh, communal or collaborative spaces that you see as well. Um, and of course, even the stuff on the walls makes a big difference in terms of how the structure uh, reads, the organization of the classroom reads. Uh, and of course, when you're thinking about um, the remote learning time right now, one of the other variables, we've never really had this variable so much in uh, the classroom, is time. We're typically, you know, strung to a 9 to 3.30 or similar um, timeline, but things have changed a lot in this last little while as well. So we have an opportunity to reimagine re things. Um, and I want you to also challenge you to think about how this actually works out in a face-to-face -face classroom. So for instance, a lot of what we've traditionally done in classrooms is about you know, providing information or you know kind of like what I'm doing right now is first of all it's synchronous um, it's uh, directed um, but there's a lot of other things that you can do with asynchronous learning uh, if you know you know blended or hybrid models or if you've heard of flipped classrooms sometimes those flip the, the what what happens in the classroom with what happens or what you expect to happen at home um, of course, there's lots of different places to get content. Um, you're going to use the textbooks that you've been provided, but there's tons of really good open educational resources that are related that are out there. Sometimes that media article, that podcast, that audio video, or even things that students create 
can be your content. And I think that's important to understand that you know, there's lots of different information. You don't have to necessarily stick with um, only the, the stuff that you find in textbooks, especially if you're considering uh, engaging students in new things. And of course, uh, I know this happens a lot, but um, it's something that we have to feel that we have some license to as long as we're finding appropriate content, certainly. And then of course, um, right now there's different instructional styles. Uh, and this comes from uh, years of online learning in particular. There's lecture driven approaches. There's more social and collaborative approaches like constructivist approaches. Um, lots of different types we're seeing certainly in the remote learning environment, but I won't spend too much time in there. Um, I'm gonna pass this for now. So uh, when I mean structure, in an online example, um, there's, there's lots of different ways you can do this. Uh, for my graduate courses, I do it in a very uh, simple way uh, where I just basically simply have a Google Doc and it tells my students everything about um, what, where the class is, where the class information is, what we're doing. It's just a long scrolling document and it's not necessarily best practice, but it gives students and parents a place to put all their stuff in a single document. So they can go to a single document and learn everything about it. Um, if you're in some school districts, you're gonna use something that is a bit different that also provides the same sort of uh, level of organization, but, um, but, but certainly something a bit more high tech. So if you're in Regina Public, for instance, or Saskatoon Public, uh, a number of other school districts, I believe, uh, across the, uh, the province, there's a good chance that you'll, uh, they'll have a Google Apps for education environment and that you can use Google Classroom. And um, I'm wondering how, uh, you know, if, in the comments, if you can let me know how familiar you are with Google Classroom, if you've used it before, um, if you've never heard of it, um, what are your, thoughts on Google Classroom, if you can just tell me in the chat. Not used it yet? Okay. Minimally familiar. Uh, so, so some use it as a student, heard of it, but okay, use it for one class. Yeah, I think there's at least one prof um, that uses it before. So Google Classroom, um, what's, what's good about this? Okay, so the one that you're probably gonna use in Regina Public, if you end up being an intern there, um, they have one that is related. You have to have a rbe.sk.ca email address, which you'll get as an intern, and then you have access to using it. But if you wanted to practice it, you can use it just by going, um, since some of you don't have some background to this, um, you would go to classroom google.com and if you have a google account or a gmail account you can use this um, you you can use this even with your own account it's probably not the one that you could that you're going to end up being uh, or using when you actually get to school because they're going to want you to use um, the official one the one for their district but if you wanted to practice this with um, your colleagues, this is something that's fairly easy to use. So I'm just going to my, one, this is mine that's linked to my uh, Gmail account. And it's really simple. So if I wanted to create a, a new class, I just go to the plus button, create a new classroom. I'm gonna continue. I'm gonna call this class name, um, intern uh, seminar, um, June 16th, and then I'm gonna call it section 001, subject, everything, room, virtual. Okay, so whatever you put there is fine, but you can create a classroom, really easy to do. And then you basically, uh, it, it's, it's so incredibly easy to use from this point, this is your, your shell. And so if I want people to come to this, um, I will have a stream, which is kind of like your Facebook stream. You'll have a place for classwork where you can create assignments and so on. You can have people, which would, of course would be your students. And 
um, then there would be your classroom. So if I give you this code, this is as simple as how you can invite people to it. So I'm gonna drop the code in the chat and I'm also gonna put the URL. And if you have a Gmail account, I'll just show you quickly, that's how you enroll people. So if you go to classroom.google.com and then at the beginning, if you remember where it said that there's that plus button on the top, right? Um, you just hit the plus, but instead of create a class, you can say join a class. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and then you can um, and then you can join the class if you want. And then I can communicate with you from it basically instantly. And that's how you would self-enroll. Now, if you were in Regina Public or where they're using this, um, when they're using this um, uh, institutionally, your students would probably be already enrolled in your class automatically. Or uh, if they don't do it that way, you can certainly do it exactly the way that I'm showing you right now. Uh, has anyone been able to join or have you, do you feel like it? <laughs> Just to show that I, you know, it actually works. Uh, we won't spend much time here, but. So if you go to classroom.google.com and then, and again, this is just, um, I think there's another way of doing it. I can also invite students by email if I had them as well. Thank you for joining, all right? So I have one student, so I can track the individual process. Um, but basically what I'm doing, uh, and of course anyone else who feels uh, uh, who wants to do the same thing, very simple to use. Uh, if I want to share something with class, so for instance, if I type in something here, uh, I, hi everyone, welcome to class. And then I can post that and I can actually even schedule a post if I want it at a certain time. So if you want certain assignments posted at different times, you can schedule them as well. But anyone enrolled in my class will be able to see that and you'll be able to also respond to that. When you're looking at classwork, um, you can create uh, assignments and questions. So for instance, if I go create, I can create an assignment, uh, a quiz, a question, some material that you're just posting, or you can reuse a post. So, uh, an assignment, for instance, would be something like um, you're, you're typing in, uh, you know, uh, let's see, write a story about yourself. And then you can click on add. And then when you click on it, you can uh, send it to a Google, Google Drive assignment, uh, a link that you have, maybe a file or even a YouTube video as well. Um, these are all Google properties here that you're using. Um, and you can even uh, supply a rubric with it. So really, really easy to use and all students will see it. What I love about this also is that you can, um, when you're sharing a, a Google Doc, for instance, you can actually make a copy for every student. So you might create a template of a story or uh, an assignment where students have to uh, type on the assignment, but you can actually make, uh, make it so that every student has the exact same copy of the assignment, and then you can actually visit each student and see how they're doing. So you can kind of see their work uh, in progress. So this is probably one of the um, better tools that you'll see out there. Uh, and so you kind of get a sense. And thanks for those who, um, who signed up as well. And again, very, very similar, very, very simple to use. Um, and once you're in there, it's very, uh, very quite, quite easy. Now, um, that's, you know, the, the pub, most of the public systems have Google Classroom. Um, others, uh, is it better than Teams? Okay, and that's where we're getting to. So Google, of course, has Hangouts. Um, they have Hangouts. I would say, in my own uh, opinion, I would say it's better than the Microsoft environment. Um, but uh, it's, they're, they're getting closer. Google Classroom was one of the first uh, tools out there that really um, kind of, that kind of took on that Facebook type feel. So it's quite easy to use. I think Google Drive and Google Docs are a lot better too. So if I had the choice, if I was the person implementing these things uh, in 
classrooms uh, or in a district, I would pick Google for sure. Um, what's also important to know is that if you're using the institutional version of it, it actually has a better terms of better terms of service for um, for your students. So it doesn't harvest their data. Whereas if you're using just a classroom version with your regular Google account, um, it doesn't have the same provision. So it's uh, it's actually better to use a institutional account. Uh, this is just an example. For instance, this is just uh, a screenshot of my daughter's. Um, my kids go to both districts in Regina, both the Catholic and the public district. Um, and for instance, the, my grade four and five students who um, has, they use Google Classroom and this is an example of what she'll see. So she can see all of her assignments um, and it makes it really easy for students to know what's due and when to do it. Uh, in this case, there's no due dates because this is during a remote teaching uh, place. Um, you can also see very simply, you can see all the teachers. So you can actually have multiple teachers on a, um, on a Google class. And of course, you can see all of your students. You can contact all of your students as well very easily. When you're going to uh, Regina Catholic, they're going to have a Microsoft environment. So that includes things like OneNote. So this is an example. This is what my um, grade seven student, my child sees. Uh, in, in their classroom, so they see it in a OneNote. So basically, instead of having a real classroom environment, they're kind of improvising with using OneNote, which is kind of like a, a collaborative note-taking tool to, to put all of what you're supposed to do in, uh, in this particular example uh, is Mr. Shada's uh, grade seven and eight classroom. So you can see what they should do. And, um, and so depending on how you develop it, you can actually have, uh, if you see on the side here, you can have like OneNote set up for every single, um, uh, every single uh, class that you might be teaching. So that's a way of kind of creating something that's similar to Google, Google Classroom. Um, not as nice and it takes a bit more work, but it, it, it's, it works in a pinch for sure. Um, and of course, when you start looking at it, there's also the, exact, the ability to create uh, templates or shared documents. So in this case, you can see that my, student, my son had an ELA assignment, um, that ELA assignment that's a TED Talk assignment. And basically it's a OneNote that was shared with my child. Um, and he's expected to fill in um, some of the work. And so this allows it, so you never really have to hand these things in. Um, basically, you do your work on it and uh, the teacher can see it at any time. So it's kind of nice that way as well. Um, of course, in some cases, so this is another teacher uh, who uses, uh, of course, other tools. So if you find that, you know, OneNote is limiting, in this case, uh, a, a teacher here, Mr. Danaher, um, basically created some of his content in another space called Wix, for instance. And so if you follow that, although it's in OneNote, it also goes to a third party site called Wix. And so that's something you can do as well. Sometimes, you know, the, the, techno the thing that you're trying to do in your class doesn't necessarily work in OneNote. So you can use, uh, you can use it to, um, to go to a third party site like this. And so the, the the key here is you want to have for your students some place that they can find everything that it's organized for them and of course um, teacher the, their parents also have access to this too and so this makes it nice so whether you use google classroom like this where students can see everything or you use um, something like OneNote, the organization is really important even if you use third-party sites um, like some of the ones I'll show you, you can still get to them all from one place. And so that's the key to this section right now is make sure that to, to whether you're doing this in a face-to-face -face classroom or, a, uh, or an online classroom, organization and structure is really incredibly important. Um, if you're in PA Catholic, for instance, something that uh, you may have, you've probably never heard of, but this is also another platform 
um, that they're using there, um, that they're adopting, and a few other school districts adopt this right over across Canada. It's called Edsby. Looks a lot like Google Classroom, um, but it is more feature filled. Um, probably not, certainly not as big. It has lots of uh, examples of being able to create a portfolio, for instance. So this is um, one example of a portfolio that you can actually see here is someone in the grade nine who can create a portfolio. So it's kind of, it's somewhere between Google Classroom and Seesaw, I guess, in some ways. So um, I guess the, the, the moral of the story here is that depending on where you end up, they're gonna be using different tools, but they do similar things. And again, it's about organizing and managing uh, student work in a digital space. Um, so uh, just looking at some tweets, this is a Jen Colbert teacher from Alberta. Um, some of the best practices that she does, for instance, is again, making sure that teachers happen to know, uh, sorry, parents are connected with their students' work. So for instance, this particular school has a web page and every one of those like the parents can go to one single place on a web page and they can click on any of these buttons and then you get connected to the classroom and this is again good practice and it makes it very easy for parents to connect uh, to their classrooms so what are we hearing uh, for parents and students they want simplicity and consistency and so making it easy for them to access the information uh, and doing it in a consistent way is really important. So when you're, when you're planning your units, try not to use, you can certainly use lots of different tools, but try not to make it too confusing for students who may have never been uh, using some of these tools and try to use tools like OneNote or Google Classroom, depending on where you end up. Um, the next part is really about developing and maintaining presence. And when I wrote this part, uh, or when I put together this presentation, it was about presence in an online classroom, which I think is much harder to do. But in this case, it's maintaining presence in any type of uh, classroom. So the one thing to know about present is it requires intentionality and effort it, uh, to remain present in students' lives uh, in the classroom as the teacher. It does take work. And of course, in an online environment, it's going to take more work. So some of the things that teachers have been done at doing, um, Google Meets, virtual field trips, Google Slides with personal messages, like a lot of things to connect them on a, uh, on a, on a regular basis. Flipgrid videos, we'll look at Flipgrid later. That's one of my favorite tools by far. Uh, it's a really great way to connect with students uh, in face-to-face -face or online or blended classrooms. Um, uh, it's great to see what teachers have been doing in the last little while. So for instance, um, I've seen great examples of uh, in the remote learning uh, uh, space, you know, there's evening bake-offs with learners, they have daily Zooms. Um, so the bake-offs are like, they have like uh, Zoom, uh, in this particular case, it was using Zoom to have sort of like baking contests among students just to kind of keep them uh, engage with one another, kind of social and collaborative, some really cool stuff that they've been doing. Um, I think I'll just pass this um, and get into examples of what, what I've seen lately from Regina schools. So um, one of the things that's great about remote teaching, um, but also I think something that should stay over in uh, when this is all done, is uh, that we see some great examples of teacher and student participation. So um, this was a spirit challenge for Millican School, uh, and I really like the idea. So they put out four or five of these challenges, I believe, and this particular challenge um, was, I think, pandemic photos or pandemic scenes. And so you can see what the teachers did, and then they're expecting for they're expecting to hear back from um, from from students. Uh, in their families to also provide um, kind of like a, a response to the, the, the pandemic photo challenge. <laughs> Let's
stay it, it. Welcome to my house. Baby, take control now. We can't even slow down. We don't have to go a while. Welcome to my house. Play the music too loud. Show me what you do now. We don't have to go a while. Okay, it's your turn. Make sure you get your parents' permission. Be as creative as you can and send it into one of the three online ways. Wait to see if you're chosen as a winner. And there's prizes! Get your milk and spirit on! So again, this is a great attempt to, to connect with parents and students during the remote period of time. But it, it, this is something that shouldn't necessarily stop just because we're not doing remote teaching any learning anymore. Uh, here were the, the, the student responses, uh, and this is one of the videos that was published on the YouTube channel as well. get the same sort of idea. Um, so there's been a lot, lot of great examples of that, again, to keep, um, to keep connected as, as students. What I've also really appreciated about this time is you know, the, the uh, sort of the emergence of teachers as content creators. Um, in the past, we typically consume or use what our textbooks have or what we find on the internet. But to maintain presence and engagement, uh, a lot of teachers are going out of their way to, to do better with what they can create for their classrooms. Uh, so for instance, this is um, uh, Britt, uh, I think her last name is Magoo now, um, uh, who you know, was just using uh, YouTube to read with her students. So I'll give you an example, a quick example of this. So for the early classroom childhood, or you know, uh, early um, childhood classroom, uh, this is a good example of, you know, daily reading that you can engage with students. Hello everyone, it's Mrs. Magoo. Y your parents and people who love you around you would love to know this is like my 17th time trying to film something. So we had to ex nay our last book because it was too long. So we're going to try a smaller book today and Minnie's here. Minnie the cat is here. She wants to say hi. But we will move on and we want to say hi or marhaban in Arabic. Marhaban in Arabic. We want to say marhaban to Peyton and Ia, hello, to Kira and Lola and Cruz and Jojo, James, Charlie, Lainey. J so what I'll stop there and she ends up reading the book. I'm not going to obviously show you the whole reading. But what, what she does really well here is, and this is a teacher from Regina who, who, who names her students. Like one of the most powerful things that the students can feel is to hear their name every day. So you should you know, go out of your way to make sure that students hear their name uh, at some point. And she does a great job of connecting in this particular way. Um, this example coming up is um, uh, an early childhood teacher um, who, um, who's from Windsor, Ontario, uh, who does a really great job with some of the things that she's been doing, uh, connecting with their classroom. And this is really a high quality stuff and I love seeing this sort of things from teachers. We're playing the mutant game again, this time in Anishinaabemowin. I teamed up with our Ojibwe language teacher, Mrs. Majaki. She really helped me out with this. Thank you so much. To me, Gretch, Mrs. Majaki. Every time you see an animal on screen, I'll ask, what is Shmaba? And if you know the answer, you can tell me. What is Shmaba means, who is this? I think I'll do really well with this. This episode is obviously especially dedicated to our Ojibwe language students who are learning Ojibwe right now but everyone will enjoy this. Okay, ready? Let's go. Round one. Nanesh maba. Eh, nimosh maba. Do you have nimosh at home? Here's the action pin for nimosh. And if you have one at home, you'll know that it needs a lot of running around. 
So you can, kind of, you can kind of see what this is like, and she does a really great job with this, and she kind of goes throughout the whole thing. But her YouTube channel is fantastic. So if you're looking for someone, again, her name is Miss Holub, H-O-L-U-B, and you can get some inspiration from someone like that. So, I, you know, I love examples. I'm not, you know, you're not expected to create these YouTube videos that will do this sort of thing, but um, these are some extreme circumstances, and it's great to see some of the talent come from teachers. Uh, in, in connecting these ways, developing presence, developing, uh, developing content to connect with their students. Um, understanding and increasing student engagement is kind of where we're going with this particular theme. Um, one of the most important things we see from the research is around engagement is that teacher, the teacher has an enormous impact on students' experience, influencing everything from students' perceived learning and self-efficacy to their motivation. So uh, if you're a motivational teacher, if you can motivate students in various ways, um, if you can help them understand their own, um, their own perception of what they're learning, how they're learning, how well they're learning, uh, their self-efficacy, um, this is incredibly important. Um, and when you're thinking about engagement, um, there's actually three sort of points here coming from recent research or not so recent research, but the idea that student engagement depends on three major factors that it's great to have some parent engagement, um, uh, some teacher engagement, and of course, peer engagement. You really only have, um, for the most part, you, you can encourage parents to engage high, higher, but of course, you do have a lot of say when it comes to teacher engagement and to uh, peer engagement in terms of how you actually set things up. So, um, you know, doing things and, and offline or online um, can be, you know, uh, all sorts of things that can be shared within the community of, of peers uh, as well as by parents. So, for instance, uh, if you don't know of these things, there's a great site called Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Um, which actually has lots of live interactions with different offices and, uh, and museums and so on. And you've probably seen examples of this. And you can do that in a classroom or you can do it for an assignment at home, but it engages people in different ways. Uh, and it provides educational experiences that would be costly or impossible otherwise. Um, and so for instance, this was a schedule a while back, but you could go to the zoo, um, there's different deep dives, climate change things. There's, there's all sorts of things. Some of them are done in French. Uh, so there's lots of good examples of, uh, that you can see on a daily basis of where you can go and what you can connect to. So these can be integrated into your classroom. Um, if you're in the Google environment uh, and if you want to um, do some VR stuff, you can actually get little kits, um, the cardboard kits for VR, and you can go into some uh, live expeditions. And these are kind of cool as well. So if you look up Google Expeditions, um, that's where you can find lots of different examples of experiential um, augmented learning experiences. Um, there's also great examples of multimedia learning environments. And I'm actually going to share, um, oh, if I, I'm going to find this video for you. Uh, well, I'll find it for you later, sorry. There's a really great um, uh, example, uh, video by, by the by Dr. Michael Wesch, who actually does a really great job of, uh, of, of helping uh, teachers better uh, understand how to create engaging videos. So this is uh, a short bit from Michael Wesch's video, and I'll try to find that video for you, or the, the link for you later. Um, or you can try finding it, his, um, his last name is Wesch, W-E-S-C-H. And he, he creates amazing videos on things like student engagement. This graph. As in lying on the floor, wondering if I should go on being a teacher or just get out of the way to make room for somebody else. This is the graph of my first online lecture. And it might look okay. After all, I held their attention for two minutes, right? More like two seconds. You see, the first part of the video is what I call a hype piece. I'm trying to provide inspiration, not information. Hook them and get them interested. Hope they stick around for the rest. In this case, it's a mashup of great quotes from the week's materials with some stock music and stock visuals for effect. How you define consciousness it matters here, but yes. plants are- I won't go through the whole thing, but he goes through, sees how different views and tries to play, get a sense 
of when and where he's engaging his students. And then he does some really cool stuff, like he shows, the, the video goes through lots of different techniques on how to develop uh, content in fairly easy ways and some great strategies if you're going to create video content. So if video content is not something you want to create, um, you can ignore this, but if, if not, it's a really uh, worthwhile video. Um, but there's, there's lots of other ways to engage socially. So I'm going to show you an example here. Uh, and I'm hoping you can join me in um, a site called Desmos. And so Desmos is a free tool. It's always free, always will be apparently. That's what they tell me. And um, it's, it's got tons of activities, mostly around math, um, but really, really engaging stuff. So uh, this is, a, this is a, an, an example of an assignment that can be done uh, by various ages, but it can be done in a class or it can be done, say, something as you, you would assign for a week to do, like asynchronously um, with classroom. So um, you, you might need Google with this, I'm not sure, but uh, let me just see if I can log in. Uh, I should be able to sign it up here, sorry. I know to, to run it, you have to use Google. Okay. So I'm gonna go in as a teacher. Again, uh, you can use it as a, as a teacher uh, example. So I'm gonna get you to go to um, uh, Desmos. Let's see, you go to that assignment and then you go to, how do you get in? Um, i trying to remember. So the class code is gonna be this. Oh yeah, here we go. New dashboard. So I'm gonna get you to go to student.desmos.com and then um, the assignments here or the, um, the, uh, the code will be this. So you'll have to sign in as a student. Uh, in this particular case, of course, you can create your own uh, example as a, as a, a teacher. And if you're teaching mathematics in particular, this would be a fantastic site to go to. Um, I've already run it. So basically what happens in this particular assignment um, is you're gonna, what you're gonna do is you're gonna go through it. And I see some people going through it already. So you're gonna select an avatar so that you're anonymous. Um, then uh, you're gonna see a grid uh in a second so it's going to look like this and here's what i'm asking you to do in this assignment is you can use four fours so the, the assignment is called four fours you can use four fours and you can also use like 0 0.4 4 0 0.4 44 but as long as you have four fours in the equation um to try to like see if you can make every one of these numbers to see if it's even possible. You can do multiplication, subtraction, um, uh, uh, division, addition. Um, basically, uh, so, for, so for instance, an example would be four plus four plus four plus four would be 16. And so you'd be able to get the 16 off there. Um, so then you're gonna see, um, you're gonna go through that. I can see an overlay, um, there's gonna be 100 numbers, and, it, and the whole idea is whether you can, you can get this uh, for everyone or not. So I can see that some of you are working on this already, and I can actually see a summary. So I get to see a lot of data in the background. So um, I can see that there's several of you working on this, and I can actually see each one of your boards. So as you try these things, um, I can see that you're logging in. And uh, let me see. So I'm going to go see snapshots. Oops, I'm going to go to four fours. Here we go. On this one, I can actually see that uh, who's trying things. So I can see that SSK is trying right now. And I can see Lauren Carlson is trying right now. So basically, um, don't worry about this if you've never done this before. It, it does makes sense in a second, but basically you use, you have to use only four fours can be an equation. And so for instance, if I want to look at teach over here, what teach did was did, you know, the four plus four plus four plus four to make 16. 
And I will go over here and um, then I'm assuming, what did you do here? You probably, you got a four somehow. And I can see that you've done that as well. But I can see um, as you come on and feel free to, to try it, just you know, put, in, put in random equations. And again, the whole idea is how many numbers can you make between zero and 99 using exactly four fours in the operations here? Uh, note you can only use uh, four, only use fours, no other numbers allowed, and you must uh, use all fours every time. So uh, you can sort of see how this is working. Um, and so you could just do, and I can see what people are trying. So like four plus four plus four minus four, or over here I can see four, same thing, uh, four times four minus, so you're playing around with it, right? And so this sort of discovery and exploration is really great when, um, you know, helping students understand it. If you just give them a worksheet, um, it'll give them some practice, but this really starts to push their minds quite a bit um, because they're playing around with it. Like Brendan over here, you know, he's got four over four plus four over four is, is going to end up being two, right? So, because that's going to be one plus one in this particular case. So, Brendan's done a really great example, and you can share these sorts of things, and it starts to push other students or 44 plus four, I don't, uh, this one that wouldn't work because I think it's missing a four, I think, Hannah. But you, yeah, um, but you can kind of get an idea. Um, oh, did I miss the code? The code is uh, up here. So it was basically, so any thoughts or uh, on, on something like this? And of course, this is just one of many activities you can do in Desmos. And you can do this at various ages. And it's fun, and again, something you can do in class, but if students are really motivated, you could say, let's do this for a week and whoever gets the most. Uh, Kira, do you use this particular one or do you use like uh, Desmos a lot? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah, oh, I like this a lot. I, sorry, I read your comment wrong. I, I, I use this a lot. I, th I thought you said I use this a lot. So this is a great example of a tool like this. And it's really, really easy to set up. Again, free, you could use, put as many students on, on it. And of course, you can provide feedback. You get to see them right now. So when they're playing around with this, um, so in this particular case, Anthea, you're using way too many fours. So basically, you can use up to four. So this is a good example of um, four plus four plus four plus four. There's four fours. And this one, four plus four plus four minus four, um, or this. So basically, you can use up to four fours. Yeah, this is a good example, thank you, uh, down there. So again, you can start to see which ones you do, and I can kind of get a sense of who's doing the most, or you could do an overlay. This would be like, in the whole entire class, these are the ones that um, uh, we're all getting together. So you can actually see, uh, as a class, you get to see how many are done. And then you also get to see how each person got them as well. So uh, that's one example. Uh, and again, this is Desmos, but it's something different and it's not necessarily just sort of your regular uh, old math. Now, if you wanna do a different one, um, another great example of one, and again, there's, there's tons of them in Desmos. It's one of my favorite resources. So here, uh, this is actually a different one. So I'm gonna create a class code for this too. This would be more like algebra. Um, so I'm gonna create a class code. I just did this. Uh, let's view the dashboard. And so it's gonna be the same thing. And feel free to go back to the other one anytime if you want to, I'll keep it open for you. So again, back to student.dismos.com and we're gonna go to a basketball related one. And I'll show you what this one looks like. And uh, you can see it up on the screen as well. And you can still see my screen now, right? Just wanna make sure. Yeah, you should be able to see my screen. I'm hoping that you can see it, okay. So in this particular case, you, again, you can see the slides that the students will see. Uh, in this particular case, this is about um, basketball. And so I can see the snapshots here. So what you're gonna see first is, uh, let's see, why don't I see it? Oh, these are just the responses. Um, summary. So some of you already said, uh, and you can go anonymize, pacing, there's a few other things here. 
Okay, so this is what the student will see. Um, okay, so what you're gonna see here is basically um, you're gonna learn, you're gonna see different examples of the, um, you're gonna see different examples of whether or not uh, the ball will hit the hoop. So there's different examples. You can kind of estimate there of when the ball will hit the hoop. And then at the same time, you get to understand um, sort of the bigger concepts around this. So some of you may get this right away that you're, you're in the math area and you have no problem with this, but this is just a really great way of visualizing um, math in a different way and actually participating. So I can see, um, again, I can see the summaries from students and some of you are doing well, some math people might be here for sure. And you can see how this is working. I can see you actually working through the different slides uh, and you know, working through the different spaces here. Some of you have passed them and so on. Again, you can see the teacher and you can see the students ones. Uh, and it's just, a, it's a nice example of uh, an activity that gives you video um, and feedback mechanisms. And for me, I get to keep uh, track of all of your work in one screen. So I can see um, if I wanted to see how each student is doing, I could just click on here and I can see what you've done and what your work is on each particular layer. So I can get a sense of that. Again, um, really easy to use. So Desmos is a tool you might wanna look at. Uh, of course, I've got a ton of other ones to look at through. So uh, I'll give you other examples of that. Uh, here's one from uh, the ELA classroom. Um, so uh, one of the skills that students should develop um, these days is the ability to, to create succinct summaries or synopses of uh, literature, for instance. So this, if you remember the, the movie Forrest Gump, um, I like this example of uh, these students actually took up uh, the, the book or the movie Forrest Gump uh, and they uh, uh, basically uh, boiled it down to a single minute uh, in this video. So here's an example of an assignment like this, a multimedia assignment. I'm gonna tell you the story of my life, cause I'm simple. When I was young, I had to wear special shoes and I met a girl called Jenny and through some miracle, I didn't need my special shoes no more. I ran so well, I played football. I got to meet the president of Mr. the president United of the States. And then Jenny Hi, came back, but she left again. Then I went to Vietnam and I met Lieutenant Dane. I've got no I brought him my bestest good friend, Bubba died. Bubba. I promised him that I'd be the captain of a shrimp boat. And I got good at ping pong and I went to China. Then I was a shrimp boat captain with Lieutenant I've got Dane. No and then I had to go back home because my mama died. Then Jenny came Hi, back, Jenny. but she left Bye. again. Then I went for a long run. People followed me. Then Jenny told me that I I was a daddy, so we got married. I don't, I don't know then Jenny died. Then little Forrest went off for his first Friend day of school. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. So this is not a different, different type of example that you can get students to you know, think about. Um, I think there, there's some really powerful ones on YouTube. Um, what I love about this one, uh, this is just a challenge um, for students at home to create Rube Goldberg machines. And what I love about this, and this is just an example from Toronto District School Board, um, where they actually have some of the submissions are, the, the, the family's engaged too, so it's not just the students engaging. And if you don't know what a Rube Goldberg machine is, it's basically a, a series of events that, uh, of things that hit each other to create sort of this longer event. Um, but it's worth looking at it. And these really fit well uh, with genius hour activities or just other creative types of uh, activities that you might bring into a classroom. Uh, and I love this, so I love this example of the family getting involved as well. you don't often see that like no one no one actually cheers after like a math worksheet or something like that 
So it's, uh, you know, so, so keeping them creative, getting students and parents involved, I think is a really great way of going ahead with this. Um, just as a, as a note, I'm not gonna get into this one, but if you wanna look up a really cool uh, collaborative tool where you can actually create, um, get people to you know, create kind of like a virtual sticky board, there is a tool called Jamboard, it's from Google. So if you Google Jamboard, um, you can find a tool that's been used a lot. And this is uh, uh, Jason Howes, who's a grade six teacher um, in Regina, who um, does this sort of example. He really likes Jamboard. So I thought I'd share that tool as another one in your repertoire. Uh, and so this is a closer up of what he does. He gets students to collaborate, collaborate on, uh, uh, on a Jamboard that he's created here. So it's kind of like a collaborative uh, jam, a collaborative sticky board. Uh, all those you know, squares in green and blue, for instance, are sticky notes uh, that people have, uh, he or others have added to it. And you can add images and so on. Um, I'll get past some of this. Um, other collaborative challenges. I, I won't show them all. Um, even what I've loved about this particular um, remote teaching time is like even some old school tech, like uh, if you ever get in this situation, like if the semester changes and you have to uh, connect with kids at home, those phone calls really make all the world of a difference. This is my five-year-old uh, talking to his kindergarten teacher and it, he just glows and warms up when, when he does. It's just kind of an amazing thing. He doesn't talk to anyone else on the phone, seriously. He doesn't have the patience. But when his, um, you know, his teacher calls, it's a whole different thing. So you can really tell that he's got a strong connection with her and, and adores her. Um, then there's, um, let's see, I'm gonna do, yeah, leverage multimedia for instruction. This is back to math a little bit as well. Um, I'm gonna show a couple of examples. Uh, one of the people you should look out for is a guy by the name of Dan Meyer, and Dan Meyer does some really great stuff um, around, uh, he actually works at Desmos now, um, but he was a California award-winning math teacher who did some real great stuff. And one of the things, I'm not sure if he invented this, but he certainly championed it, uh, is this, this um, it's called three-act math. It's kind of like a concept for teaching math lessons. And the problem with, Math instruction in many cases, uh, and your you know your math profs can tell you a lot, can do this a lot better. And I'm I'm not the one who's the expert here, but uh, I have the technology side of it. Um, but but a lot of what we see in classical math programs is it's not very motivating, and we just give students the um, the formulas without really discussing why we're giving them the formulas or even getting getting them to be inquisitive. So this is an example of what's called three-act math, and there's lots of good examples of three-act math problems. Uh, if you Google it, you'll find a whole database of it. So in this case, um, what he does in the first part of the lesson is he finds videos, and there's actually tons of these on YouTube uh, that have done, been done through three-act math. In this case, he just simply has a video of this penny stack, and then, what he does is, yeah, as a teacher, um, will ask questions like, uh, or students will ask questions about, you know, how many pennies are in there? Like, and they speculate and he asks questions like, what is the, the lowest number that it could possibly be? Or what is the highest number that it could possibly be? And so they speculate on this and they try to get a sense of this and they come up with good guesses and estimated estimates and so on. And then, uh, the, the second part of the uh, act, I guess the second part of the, the lesson is act two. This is where you start to give some details about what they're seeing now. So you, you give them uh, 40 by 40 stacks. Uh, each stack has 13 pennies, like the details are coming in. And um, you can give them speculation or, or specifications on this. Some of this information is going to be extraneous. Um, and then it's not till act three that you actually give them the formula. So it's lots of time spending, spend, spent creating uh, curiosity and, and creating inquisitive kids and asking questions. And it's not until later that you actually bring them the formula. And this is a really kind of a good rule of thumb uh, 
uh, in, in many of the math lessons. Um, other tools that I think are, are used a lot in classrooms, certainly about right now, are anything with, uh, related to screencasting. Um, some of the ones that you can buy, of course, and sometimes they have better deals for schools, but Explain Everything is a common one that works on the iPhone or iPad. Um, Educreations, again, these are a lot of these ones you have to pay for. Um, Loom is something you can get that's a really great tool, um, and Screencastify. And I'll actually show you Screencastify because it's just a Chrome plugin. So, for instance, if you Google Screencastify, and this would be a tool that you would use if you're doing any sort of instruction that involves a screen. Like if you want to explain what's happening on your screen, um, whether it's on a web page or you know, whether it's uh, you know, doing some whiteboard stuff or whatever it might be. If you want to, um, uh, if you want to uh, explain anything, these are really great tools for that. So uh, I put in the link for Screencastify, which is probably my favorite. Um, and this is how it works. So basically, um, maybe you're talking about Wikipedia and you're going through some resources and you want to share an instructional video with students. Um, so if you, if you install this into Chrome or Firefox or whatever you're using, um, you basically just click on the Screencastify tool. It'll give you some options, like you, do you want to record the browser tab or the entire desktop? I'll say the browser tab in this case. Do you want a microphone and do you want a webcam? And I can select a webcam. I have actually a different world webcam over here too. So I'll run this webcam and then you hit record. And so right now I'm recording and uh, talking to you and then I may just talk about Wikipedia or whatever it is, but you can see my voice. You can see the pages I'm looking at and anything I talk about and you can hear me. And when you're done, you just click on that Screencastify tool again, stop the recording, and then it automatically has a video, and it's muted right now, but, or whatever it is, but you can see my voice, you can see the pages I'm looking at, and anything I talk about, and you can hear me. And of course, the audio was a bit rough on that one, but uh, then from there, you can share it to Classroom. So if you want to share it to Google Classroom, you've got a direct way of doing that or you can publish it to YouTube. So it's, it's just that easy to create one. Or if you wanna like cut off some stuff at the beginning and the end, you can go open the editor. And this is free right now. Um, there, there are some pro features, um, but it's worth getting an account and playing around with it. It's one of my favorite tools uh, that you'll find out there. Um, other examples of you know, tools and methodologies to use. Um, if you are into VR, uh, you may have, heard of the game um it's alex uh i forget what it's called um but this is a teacher just recently who went into this environment uh, i forget i forget the name of the game i know what the last part is alex a l y x um and so a teacher um decided to teach from vr which i think was kind of cool a little out there but it's kind of cool Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, welcome to our welcome to our lesson 18 math video. This is actually yeah, I'm gonna fast forward a bit. Well, you can see what he's doing there. He's created this sort of a virtual whiteboard. I think it's called Half-Life, sorry. So we should have a quick review of them. And let me tell you about each of them. I'm really sad that I'm missing my marker. You know, I can't just go can't just go buy a new one these days. He's looking for his marker. This angle. And let me see if I can do it. They don't have to be like this angle. No, I won't go through the whole thing. Um, and you know, this would be more rare and more of a novelty, but kind of a cool example of a new technology is to do something di a bit different. Um, there's lots of really great stuff in Minecraft. Uh, Minecraft and education is big. So if you ever want to think about that, sure. lots of great examples of Minecraft as well. Um, then I want to get into like probably the last section here, since we only got about 10 minutes, um, is new forms of feedback and assessment. Um, so, you know, the types of assessment that you, you know about, for the most part, um, the quick rule of thumb is when you're giving feedback, lots of feedback matters. And 
timely feedback matters. And so for instance, when you look at sort of more summative um, examples, in these cases, every student ends up with the same grade, but they're, they're on very different trajectories. So one student number one, for instance, um, actually improves all year. And that's what you want to see, I think, in most cases. Number two actually started really you know, strong and then she ended up doing poorly. And so that's probably more on the negative side. One is remaining consistent. Um, number four is she failed a few times and then she ended up doing well. Um, but the numbers don't tell you a whole lot. And you know, the feedback, the, the, um, the formative assessment matters a lot. Uh, and I like this you know, guidance from uh, Reeves here who says, too often educational tests, grades, and report cards are treated by teachers as autopsies when they should be viewed as physicals. And, and so don't leave all your uh, feedback to the end of class. Uh, and certainly um, one of the most important parts of um, formative assessment is that, they sh that the data that we get helps to shape our instructional decisions. So um, use assessment in that way, not just to inform students, but also to inform you as a teacher uh, as to you know, what you could be doing differently, how you could be teaching differently, how you can cover different areas differently. So um, one of the, the key tools that I really love is something called Flipgrid. This is absolutely free. Um, it was from uh, University of Minnesota, but then it was bought by Microsoft and it's still free. I get an account today, um, if I were you. Um, it's, it's great for creating uh, opportunities to provide students with the able to, uh, to be able to allocute and share and participate together. So uh, I think I have an example of, so if I go to my Flipgrid, just to show you what this looks like. So basically it allows you to post questions and then students in a, in a private environment are able to um, respond. And I think they use this in Regina Public, um, lots of other districts as well. So I'll give you an example from my grad class. So in this case, I just create a short video for students. Hey everybody, this is Alec Kuros. I'm your professor for ECNI 830. Looking very much forward to meeting you all. This is the- so Basically I ask them a question and, and I intro myself. And what it ends up looking like is students get this link and they just have to press the plus button. And when they press the plus button, uh, I can go to every one of their videos and these are all video responses, but it's not on YouTube. So it's not some um, you know, mainstream uh, place. It also has rubrics. You can also see like in this case, a number of students are replying to each person as well. So you can actually have students reply in video as well. But it's a really rich way of collaborating. Uh, I've seen excellent examples of projects in, in something like this. And really great for um, rich assessment, audio and video assessment in many ways. Uh, so, so, so consider that tool, again, one of my favorites. Um, going ahead and I'll add maybe one last one uh, before we sort of wrap up here. Um, or maybe to, I'll show you Socrative. And uh, this is a tool, again, uh, free if, unless you use some of the, uh, you know, the big pro features, but free for individual teachers. Um, let's do a quiz. And this is a great tool for quizzes. And we'll do, say, a 3D Ed quiz. Um, here's an example. I'll give you instant feedback. Start. And so in this case, what I'm gonna get you to do is if you go to Socrative.com, um, so just go to Socrative.com, and um, there should be a student place to sign up as a student, or uh, when you go into, um, when you go to login, it'll actually say student login, and then type in 95209. And then once you do that, you should be able to um, get into the quiz that I'm running right now. So I'll go back to where I was. Here we go, Socrative. And so once you get in there, thank you, Andrea, you're in there already. And Anthea, um, Carolyn, you can see this. And then you're gonna get a bunch of questions and feel free to go through the questions. And I'm gonna give you license to, to say, you know, if they're wrong, that's fine too. You're just checking it out. So uh, don't, so, Typically, I can see 
what's happening in, um, you know, with students and, and how well versed you are with Trudy Ed are some of the questions I have here. And if anyone gets it wrong, instead of looking green, it's going to look red. And so you can kind of see what that looks like. So thank you, Anthea, for uh, deliberately doing that so I can see what it looks like. Um, uh, and you can actually see an example here. So very quickly, I can see that there might be something missing. Now, you wouldn't show this to students. Um, this is something that you would keep to yourself. But in this case, because you're all teachers, I just wanted to show you what you would see. And what's great about this is you can set up these tests. You can share these tests with other people. All you need to know is the test number. So you can easily collaborate, share, share tests across the system. You can look up databases of tests that are already created by other teachers. And this is a really easy way to do online testing that gives immediate feedback about the, the answer for each one. So if you got it wrong, you're gonna hear, you're gonna get the feedback. So this is an example right here. Uh, I'm not sure what question number five was, but question number five makes me think that I need to teach whatever this concept is better because hardly anyone got it, so, or, or no one got it. Um, so to me, that's an example of any, well, Carolyn got it, but it is an example of uh, what might be taught better, for instance, and so this really helps you understand if no one's getting it, you can see right there clearly on the screen that you might want to do something a bit different. And uh, so I'll show you one last tool and then to kind of wrap up. Um, another one that's really cool, and this would be more gamified, I guess. Um, so I know some of you mentioned that uh, you know, um, you know, a Kahoot and Kahoot is very popular. This is somewhere between Socrative and Kahoot. And you need a Google account for this, but I don't believe students need anything. Um, so for instance, let's see, where is the ones that I've been using before? Um, let's go with emotions, okay. So an example of this, really easy, I'm gonna play this live. And of course, this is just a, one example of a uh, test. There's lots of tests out there. So in this case, if you're using quizzes, um, you go to joinmyquiz.com, and in this case, there's a two-game code. And that code is, oh, sorry, that, yeah, that's the right one, okay. And then I'll start the game. No, okay, no students in game. So like uh, Kahoot, once you get in there, I should see this populate, and I'll see examples of, um, I'll see examples of people coming into the room. And I'll start it in a second and then we'll just wrap up. All right. So if you're in there, I can show this and this is going to be an easy test, but, and you can make it collaborative, you can make it competitive, you can do a number of things. Uh, this is kind of one of my favorite uh, more recent tools. All right, that's enough to start here. You should be able to join still, but so right here you'll be able to see uh, yes, uh, emoji. This is just one of many. see the specific questions if I wanted to if I was wondering as a teacher you know what's each one here um, so you get an idea but um, these are these are great if, if you're looking at social emotional learning or um, just internet trivia this would be a good quiz for that but of course there's, there's tons of quizzes that are available that you can see by search um, you can look ones that are very specific to subject or topic um, and they're already created. Of course, you want to check them for um, compatibility with the curriculum you're teaching and for accuracy because anyone can create these. 
and they could be wrong. And so you want to make sure that you are, and of course you can create your own, but um, it gives you an idea. Now there's different orientations. You can create, again, teams, uh, more game-based. You can get rid of the competitive piece uh, and make it more like Socrative, but that's just one example. Anyway, um, thanks everyone. I know, uh, thanks Ashley, uh, if you had to go already. Um, it's 11.30. Um, just want to leave you with this last minute um, idea. Um, throughout your career, you're going to see technology uh, and pedagogy, but what I wanted to show you is just remember that the humanity, the connections are really, really important things. Um, uh, so feel free to go if you need to. I'm going to ask, answer whatever questions you have. I see Tracy has a question around Moodle. Moodle is okay. Um, Moodle is used mostly in the university environment, but some students, some schools use it. Um, if you're teaching for, um, for instance, uh, DLC, which is the Distance Learning Consortium, um, with, thanks, Cynthia. Um, there's, they, they actually use it for their online courses. It's good, but it's, it's, it's exactly what UR Courses is. UR Courses is actually Moodle. Um, it's just a little bit, um, it's a little bit old school. It's not so multimedia rich, but you can make it good if you connect to things um, outside of Moodle. You can make it more exciting with all these tools. So if you're stuck in a district that uses Moodle, or if you're in a district that uses Moodle, I think Yorkton, uh, Great Spirit Youth School Division used to use it. Um, you can make it all right. It's not perfect, but it does give you the basic organization for a course. And what I do like about Moodle is it's absolutely free. It's open source. Um, so it's, it's kind of a cool tool for that. Anyway, um, any other questions? Uh, this will be available. Uh, I can also um, provide a link to some resources as well. Uh, yeah, I can give you all the resources. So what I'll do is I'll send, I'll send the organizer Jill um, a link with all the resources and a bunch of other ones that you might want to try as well. So I'll make sure that they get there. And if you have any other questions for me, uh, feel free to at any time uh, email me. Easiest way to get a hold of me is coros at gmail.com. And uh, best of luck to you uh, in the internship. And uh, if you need some help with me from me during your internship, feel free to give me a, a call, uh, like an a email, and I'll try to set you up. Um, and I wish you all the best. The internship is an amazing experience. It's going to be a tough year for you, um, but you're going to do well, and you know, uh, you're going to have a great experience, and, and I'm sure um, you, you'll be in the classroom in no time. So thanks for being part of our program. Uh, and best of luck to you. Uh, and again, I'll stay around for any questions if, if you have any. Oh, I'm glad it's helpful, thank you. All right, I'm gonna end the recording.